What's going on everybody? I'm Johnny Brook. Welcome back to another Crafted Workshop video and welcome to my home theater. So in this week's video, I'm gonna show you how I took this very dark, cluttered, just kind of ugly room and transformed it into a super bright, clean looking room that could double as a living room, but also as a fully dedicated home theater with the press of one button, thanks to some smart home gadgets, this motorized projector screen, and this LG Cinebeam 4K projector. And LG sponsored this video, so big shout out to them. And I'll tell you guys more about that projector later in the video, but without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with the video. So let's rewind a bit and take a look at how this home theater or media room started out. So just for some context, this is one of the first rooms you see when you walk into our house. And as you can see, it didn't look so hot before. So the main issues with the room were a severe lack of light with no lighting whatsoever in the space compounded by blackout curtains, as well as just lackluster cable management and just overall a cluttered and dark looking space. So my goal with this project was to create a light, inviting living room that could also double as a full-on home theater when we wanted it, but could also be transformed back at the push of a button using some smart home gadgets. Basically a stealth home theater, if you will. So the first step was to get the room cleared out so that I could start working in the space, and then I needed to remove the chair rail and crown molding from the room. So first I scored the caulk along all four edges of the trim, and if you don't thoroughly score it, the trim will likely take some of the drywall paper with it when you remove it, so just make sure to use a good sharp knife here. After scoring, I used this super handy tool aptly named the trim puller, which basically just acts as a wedge between the trim and the wall and helps to pry off the trim without damaging the wall behind it. And I'll link to this tool as well as all the other tools I used in the video description below in case you're interested. So I did still manage to tear the drywall paper in a few spots as I worked my way around the room, but I'll show you how to fix that later on. Next, as I mentioned, I needed to remove the crown molding from this room. And whoever built this house really loved their molding, but it had to go to make room for the soffit I'd be building. So the process for removing this was the same as the chair rail, except this molding was in three pieces, and as I moved inside the room, I was a little bit less careful when it came to actually scoring the caulk because I knew this entire area would be covered by that soffit. Speaking of which, next I could start laying out exactly where I wanted the soffit to go. And in case you aren't familiar with what a soffit is, in this case, it's basically a small bump out that wraps around the upper corner of the room. And I've also seen these called bulkheads depending on what part of the world you're in, but the general purpose is to hide something whether that's AC ductwork, plumbing, or in this case, lots and lots of wires. So I decided that I wanted my soffit to have a finished height of roughly 10 inches, which would give me enough depth for the motorized projector screen I plan to install, plus ample space for the recessed lighting, wiring, and in-ceiling speakers. So I started by making a mark at eight and three quarters of an inch from the ceiling, which is where the bottom of the two x four ledger that attaches to the wall would sit. And then I set up my line laser even with that mark. And by the way, I'm gonna be using my line laser a ton on this project. I'd highly recommend one for any kind of home improvement projects like this. You can get them for around 150 bucks and they will pay for themselves, believe me. Next, I went around the room and measured from the ceiling down to my laser line, just to see how much of a difference there was from one end of the room to the other. And as it turned out, one side of the room was close to an inch higher than the other, which is why using something like a line laser is so important in situations like this. Continuing on with layout, next I figured out where my ceiling joists were located using a stud finder, and part of the framing on this soffit will attach to those joists. Unfortunately, there was no ceiling joist to tie into in this kind of open section of the wall, but I came up with a solution for that later on. So with my layout work done, I can move on to actually framing the soffit, and I started by getting a 2x4 ledger attached to the wall along the entire perimeter of the room. After measuring, I headed to the garage to cut a 2x4 to length, and one tip when purchasing 2x4s for this project is to buy 2x4s as long or longer than the length of the walls in your room, if possible. So this room, for example, is 12 feet by 13 feet roughly, so I bought mostly 12 foot and 14 foot 2x4s. And this just allows you to have one straight run on each wall, rather than having to piece together a bunch of 8 foot 2x4s. I used 3 inch screws for the framing on this project, mostly because screws can be removed if mistakes are made. And I did mess with my framing nailer a bit on this first board, but quickly decided to just stick with screws. So as you can see, I just lined up the bottom edge of the ledger with my line laser and drove in the screws into the studs. And it was really just rinse and repeat around the rest of the room until I got to the wall opening. And I decided to run a ledger across this opening, which gave me a place to attach my soffit later on. 
The other half of the framing in this wall opening was on the other side, and once again I referenced my line laser here, marking the height at each end of the opening, and then used the laser measure to get the length. I cut the pieces the length of the miter saw, cutting the pieces for the two sides and top and bottom of the framing initially, and then screwed them all together. After test fitting, I could attach the framing to the wall, making sure the bottom edge of the frame was in line with my laser, and that the face of the framing was plumb. I also made sure to set the framing back half an inch from the faces of the columns, which allowed me to cover this framing with half inch drywall later on. I came back and filled in the framing with blocking, and since the height was different from one end of the framing to the other, I did have to cut the blocks to fit, just making sure the bottom edge of the framing was level as I went. Next up was the 2x2 framing, which mounted to the ceiling, and 2x2s typically only come in 8 foot lengths and are also usually extremely twisted, so I went ahead and ripped my 2x2s from longer 2x4s using my table saw. After ripping, I cut the first piece to length off camera and then attached it to the ceiling, making sure to drive my screws into the joists above. And I once again used my line laser here for reference, but this time I was running the line vertically, which meant I had to set up the line manually. It's essentially like a digital chalk line. To set this up, I marked out the distance from the wall where I wanted my line, drove in a screw at that location, and hung my laser from that screw, and it's automatically centered on that screw. I then marked out the same distance at the other end of the wall and just lined up the laser with my mark, which ensured a perfectly straight line across the ceiling, regardless of whether the wall was bowed. I continued the process on the center wall, running this 2x2 between those first 2x2s that I mounted. And the ceiling joists run parallel to this 2x2, rather than perpendicular like with the first 2x2s. And I actually sized this soffit to line up with the ceiling joist here, so that I didn't need to add any additional framing here but that wasn't the case with the last 2x2 kind of near that wall opening. For that, I needed to get a little creative. So first I attached the 2x2 to the existing 2x2s with more three inch screws, and then also used a few toggle bolts in the middle of the 2x2, which allowed me to attach it to the drywall. Next, I tied into the existing 2x4 structure with some 2x4 stretchers, which I added between the 2x2 and 2x4 framing. Finally, with what was probably some serious overkill, I added one more 2x4 across the wall opening, which supported those 2x4 stretchers from below. With that, the initial framing was done, so I could move on to doing some sheathing. And this whole soffit is made up of two layers of sheathing on both the vertical and horizontal faces, with a base layer of half inch plywood for some structure, and then a top layer of drywall for looks. Before ripping the plywood to width, I set up my laser in the same spot as when I added the 2x4 ledger initially, and then measured to see how much of a difference there was along the 8 foot length the plywood would be spanning. And rather than trying to scribe the plywood to exactly match the measurement, I just ripped it to the narrowest width, again using the table saw. If you don't have a table saw, you could get your local home center to make these cuts in bulk for you, and then just do any fine tuning with a circular saw. I attached the plywood to the 2x2 with some inch and 5 8 trim head screws, making sure to line up the bottom edge of the plywood with my line laser. And I just continued working my way around the room, cutting the pieces of plywood to length where needed, and using the offcuts to start the next section. Before moving on, I luckily remembered to double check the area where I'd be attaching the motorized projector screen to see if it lined up with the ceiling joists, and of course it didn't. So thankfully I was able to add a few pieces of blocking to solve this. With that done, I worked my way around the room another time, attaching another 2x2 to the bottom edge of the plywood, and this would serve as the attachment point for the sheathing on the bottom side of the soffit. Next, I could take a break from the building and switch gears to some electrical and wiring. So first I figured out the exact locations where I wanted the recessed LED lights on the underside of the soffit, and marked those locations with some painter's tape. Once that was done, I could work on tapping into the existing electrical circuit in this room, and to do this, I needed to remove the existing junction box so that I could run some new Romex. I double checked that the circuit wasn't live after turning it off at the breaker, used a reciprocating saw to cut the nails holding the box to the stud, and then removed it from the wall. Next, I marked out and cut a hole for a two gang electrical box, which will house a new pair of switches, one for this recessed lighting and one for some LED strips that will run along the inside edge of the soffit. Next, I drilled a hole with a hole saw above the ledger board above the outlet I had cut out, and then I could start fishing my Romex through, running the wire down through the wall and out the outlet opening, and then across the open wall area. 
I cut the wire at each light location, leaving about a foot of extra wire on each end so that I'd have plenty of room to wire things up later. And I actually screwed up at the beginning of the run and forgot to run wire down to the switch first, so I had to go back and redo that section, but I attached the new workbox permanently once I roughed in the wiring there. Next, I could actually wire up all the recessed lights, which I just picked up on Amazon, and they include everything you need except for the service entrance connectors, which keep the Romex from being pulled out, and they're pretty much foolproof to wire. The lights can also be disconnected from the box, which is definitely a nice feature since I was able to wire these up before sheathing the underside of the soffit. I'll link to these in the video description below in case you're interested. Now depending on how much load you're going to be adding to your circuit, you should probably run some numbers just to make sure the circuit is beefy enough to handle it. In my case, I was just adding a few LED lights, which draw very little power, and then adding a few more outlets for items I was already using in this space, so I knew I was good. Speaking of which, after the lights were up, I ran another circuit for those additional outlets, including one for the motorized projector screen, one for the LED light strips, and one for my LG Cinebeam 4K projector. And the outlet for the LED strips is mounted to the front of the soffit itself, so I went ahead and cut out the opening and installed it, and then I went back and wired up all the outlets so that I could test everything out before moving on. Thankfully, everything worked on the first try, and I'll show a little more detail on the lighting system later on, including the switches, so stick around for that if you're interested. The next set of wiring to work on was for the in-wall and in-ceiling speakers, and I decided to add a pair of side surround and rear surround in-wall speakers, as well as a pair of Dolby Atmos ceiling speakers, all from the Dayton audio line from Parts Express. So after laying out the locations of the speakers, I cut a hole for a low voltage box at the front of the room, and then I could start running all of the cables, which actually took way longer than I anticipated. I should also mention that I used in-wall rated speaker wire, which you should do as well if you want your install to be up to code and safe. I also ran a fiber optic HDMI cable for the projector while I was at it. So as I've mentioned, the projector I'm using in this smart home theater is the LG Cinebeam 4K projector, and I've got to say, this thing is amazing. Once again, just for transparency, LG is sponsoring this video, but that does not change my opinion on this projector. So I've been a projector guy for about two and a half years now since building my first DIY projector screen, and this LG Cinebeam 4K projector is definitely the coolest projector I've tried to date. Essentially, this is an all-in-one smart projector system, including built-in apps for Netflix, YouTube, Amazon Prime, and a bunch more. And the backlit Magic Remote features Google Assistant voice control. Search for Crafted Workshop on YouTube. And you can easily adjust your settings via the remote to dial in an awesome image extremely quickly. You realistically don't even need to connect this projector to anything, except maybe a good set of speakers to get a pretty much theater-like experience. And the projector features built-in Bluetooth if you want to go totally wireless with your speakers. Also, what you're seeing here is only a 106-inch screen, which is all I could fit in this space. But this projector is capable of projecting up to a 140-inch screen. And I think the LG Cinebeam 4K projector is a great choice for everyone from home theater novices to aficionados. So if you're interested in learning more, check out the links in the video description below. And big thanks again to LG for sponsoring this video. So this is how the room looked with all of the wiring in, and here's the cables coming out of the wall at the front of the room, all thankfully labeled, of course, and I'll tidy up this mess a little bit later. So with the wiring done, I could get the framing finished up with some more 2x4 stretchers across the bottom of the soffit. And these stretchers ensure the vertical soffit faces are plumb and kind of lock the pieces in place before adding that horizontal soffit sheathing on the underside. I once again called on the line laser here and set it up so that the laser would land between the plywood and the 2x2 when the soffit was plumb. I could just cut my 2x4 stretchers to fit this space and then attach it with some more 3-inch screws. I worked my way around the room, adding blocking every two to three feet, and also made sure to leave plenty of space around where I'd be installing the recessed lighting, as well as those in-ceiling speakers. My buddy Eddie also came over at this point to help with the sheathing, and it was so nice having two sets of hands during this part of the build. So speaking of sheathing, next it was time to add the drywall to the vertical soffit face, and I used 12 foot long sheets of drywall in this project just to minimize the number of seams I had to tape and mud. So after measuring, I cut the drywall to width, first scoring the front face of the sheet, snapping it along the scored area, and then cutting the piece free by cutting the backer paper. 
We cut the piece to length using the same method, and then we could get it attached to the soffit using some inch and 5 eighths drywall screws, making sure to hit those 2 by 2s behind the plywood. And we definitely went a little bit overboard with the screws here, running them about every 8 inches, but that drywall ain't going anywhere. So we just worked our way around the room until we had all four vertical faces covered, and then we could prep for the sheathing on the underside. So to do this, I temporarily fastened all of the hanging wiring above where the sheathing would run, as it can create a major fire hazard if this wiring gets trapped between the sheathing and the framing. Next, we could get the horizontal sheathing installed, and I had already pre-ripped some 18-inch wide strips from some leftover half-inch plywood over at my shop, so we started with those. The main goal here was to maintain a consistent overhang between the front edge of the horizontal sheathing and the vertical sheathing, about three inches in our case. And since we knew the vertical soffit was plumb and straight, we just needed to have that consistent overhang to make sure the horizontal soffit was also straight. We also marked in four and a half inches from the front edge of the piece using a speed square, just to give us a reference line to add our screws, and then we fastened the panels with more of those inch and five eighths trim head screws. The next wall had a wider soffit at 23 and a half inches versus the 18 inch section previously, so I ripped two sections to that width from a sheet of half inch plywood at the table saw. And one thing I actually haven't mentioned up to this point is that the soffit actually isn't the same size on all four walls. The two opposite walls with the projector screen and projector have an 18 inch wide soffit, while the two opposite walls with the wall opening and that smaller window have a 23 and a half inch wide soffit. And this sizing difference was just due to the joist locations in the ceiling above to which the soffit is attached. So we worked our way around the room, switching back to the 18 inch wide panel on the wall with the larger window until we got to that wall opening where we had to notch the plywood around that first column. So we laid out the measurements on the plywood with it oriented how it would be attached to the ceiling to avoid any confusion and then cut out the notch with a jigsaw. Once it was notched, we could attach that piece and then fill in that last gap on the 18 inch wide soffit section. The next area we needed a notch was a little bit trickier as this column kind of protrudes from the wall and then jogs back in, but we got it cut with some careful layout. And after test fitting, we actually went ahead and transferred that layout to the piece of drywall we'd be using on this area as we knew the fit was good and it would just help to avoid mistakes later on. Once the marks were transferred over, we attached that last piece of plywood to finish off the plywood sheathing. The next step in the build was to attach a 1x2 nailer to the front edge of the horizontal plywood, which served a few purposes. One, it would help align the plywood edges where the panels met up, and two, it would provide a place to nail on the 1x4 trim I'd be adding later. We attached the strips with wood glue and 1 inch brad nails, and I made sure to add a bunch of nails where the panels butted up to each other, and even clamped a few of them together while the glue dried just for good measure. With that done, we could move on to adding drywall to the underside of the soffit, which was definitely one of the more frustrating parts of this project, just due to those extremely awkward 12 foot long sheets. First, we cut the piece to width using the tape measure and utility knife trick. Next, I cut the panel's length, which I cut from the wrong side, but thankfully it still worked. And this first piece was actually that panel spanning the wall opening with the two columns to cut around. It was definitely the most difficult piece to fit, but it was nice to kind of get it out of the way first thing. We cut out where we had marked with the plywood template using a combination of the drywall saw and scoring and snapping. And then we carried the panel inside very carefully to get it hung in the space. Off camera, we also slapped together a dead man, which is what this T-shaped two x four is called to assist in this, but it really wasn't that helpful and kind of made things more awkward in my opinion. So the big risk with this particular piece was it's snapping in the narrow areas, since drywall isn't that sturdy when cut to these narrow widths. And it was definitely really stressful getting the piece placed, but eventually after some finagling, we got it in place and could add a few screws to hold it. Holy crap. So once that first piece was in, the other three were relatively easy since they were all just basically rectangles. We did try the dead man again on the second piece, but once again, it didn't really seem to help much. The last piece of drywall to add was on the other side of that wall opening, and this piece ended up very close to flush with the existing columns, which was a big relief. Finally, I came back and added a bunch of drywall screws to finish things off, and I used a specialty tip on my impact driver to add the screws here, which ensures the screw heads are just below the surface of the drywall without puncturing the drywall paper. With the drywall hung, I went ahead and cut some holes for the lights before moving on to taping and mudding so that I could have some more light to work with. 
and I used a giant hole saw size specifically for can lights for this. And this thing was pretty difficult to use, especially with this long arbor. I'll definitely pick up a shorter arbor if I have to use this hole saw again in the future, as I just about broke my dang wrist trying to drill all five of these holes. Of course, the cord wasn't long enough on this first hole I drilled, and I had to order some extensions for the lights on this wall, but I could get one of the lights on the narrower soffits hooked up, and they looked great. Finally, it was time for a process that I absolutely hate, drywall finishing. I've only messed with drywall mudding and taping once during the shop build, and it is far from my favorite task. So I started by filling any of the larger gaps between the drywall panels with what's called hot mud, which comes in different curing times. And I used five minute mud because I wanted to be able to top coat it with tape and mud quickly. But having that five minute window to work in definitely added a lot of stress. I also forgot to buy a drywall pan to mix the mud in. So I was stuck with mixing it in some random plastic container I had hanging around the garage. Once that layer of hot mud set up, I could add the corner bead to the outside edge of the soffit in the wall opening. And I used vinyl corner bead here, which is attached initially with spray adhesive. I added a coat to the inside of the corner bead as well as the outside corner of the wall, let it dry for a few minutes, and then installed it. And I just made sure to flush it up with both faces of the corner, and I also used a long level to check for flatness. Next, I could get to the actual mudding, and I used a pre-mixed dust control mud here just to try and keep the dust down. And pre-mixed mud is usually full of air bubbles and is also a little bit thick, so it's best to add a little water and really mix it thoroughly, which just helps remove some of those bubbles. So first, all of those screw holes needed to be filled with mud, and luckily my wife gave me a helping hand on this process while I worked on taping the seams. And I used this self-adhesive tape as I figured it'd be easier since I was working overhead, and it seemed to work pretty well. You don't have to mud under this tape, and the holes in the tape allow mud to kind of fill in that gap behind the tape. After taping the seams, I tried my hand at that outside corner and it was challenging to say the least. So my main goal with this first coat was really just to fill in that area around the corner bead to give myself some room to sand later. And I also went ahead and taped and mudded the inside corners under this section as I wasn't sure just how much the crown molding would hide later. The next day I came back and added a second coat of mud to all the joints using a trowel on these bigger areas. And I ended up watching a lot of Canadian YouTube home improvement guys before this project and they all seemed to love the trowel and hawk so I figured I'd give it a try and I did like it overall. With that I called the mudding complete, saving sanding for the very end of the project so next I could move on to installing all of the trim. Before doing that though, I needed to cut the opening for the projector screen, which proved to be the second most messy task of this whole project behind actually sanding the drywall. And this ended up getting dust throughout our main floor here and <laughs> my wife was not too happy. So after cutting this giant hole in the ceiling, we test fit the screen just kind of as a sanity check and luckily it fit great so we can move along with installing the trim. We started with the crown molding around the very top of the soffit. And I used a smaller crown for this, really just enough to cover the drywall screws. This was my first time working with crown and I am far from an expert, but the basic thing to keep in mind is that you're always cutting your crown upside down due to how the angles work on your miter saw. And this can be a real kind of brain wrinkler. You just wrinkled my brain, man. So after trimming the piece down a bit more, we could get it installed. And we cut these little guide pieces off camera with one of each corner profile cut into them and this really helped get things aligned in the corners. So once we had the pieces fitting nicely, we marked where the crown landed on the wall and ceiling, and then added a few beads of caulk behind the crown in those areas. And caulk is a great adhesive for things like this, and this will just help keep gaps from forming over time. To permanently attach this smaller crown, we used one inch brad nails, and just made sure to hit framing wherever possible. Once the first piece was in, it was really just rinse and repeat around the other top three edges. And luckily I was able to buy pieces long enough to get all of these out of one piece per wall, which meant no splicing on this first run. Next, we could add more crown to cover the seam between the bottom of the soffit and the existing wall. And we use larger crown here as it matches the rest of the house better. And we also switched to 16 gauge finish nails here since this is larger molding and we could also hit more framing. We did have to make a splice cut on the second wall since it was a little bit over 12 feet. To make a splice cut on crown, you can cut the piece at a variety of angles, but we stuck with 45 degrees since the saw was usually already set to that angle. And rather than having the crown sit diagonally like we had it on previous cuts, this time we put the crown flat against the miter saw fence and then made the cut. 
As you can see, the splice came together really nicely and is basically invisible in the finished space. We attached this piece to the wall in the same way with caulk at both ends and finished nails throughout. And then we can move on to the trickiest piece of crown in this room where it met up with this door casing. And this is an oddly tall doorway at 97 inches high at the top of the casing. So I'm guessing you won't run into this issue, but we'll just go over it quickly in case you do. So after some thought, I figured notching the piece out with the table saw would probably give me the best results. So I made a test cut and it worked pretty nicely, but the cut needed to be angled back more. So to accomplish this on the actual piece, I oriented the crown in a similar way as on the miter saw in that kind of diagonal orientation, and then just started clearing out material. So after removing the bulk of the material with the table saw, I cut away the excess with my pull saw and then cleaned up the cut with my block plane and then I could fit the piece. And luckily with just a little bit more fine tuning, the piece fit great and it really blended in perfectly with the existing door casing. So we got it attached to the wall, not before cutting the splice angle on the other end. And then we could get that last long piece of crown installed. And we left the last shorter bits of crown for me to install since I could do those by myself. So from there, we moved on to the one x four trim. And this trim covers the front edges of the soffits, which don't really look great since they're made up of plywood and drywall edges. Compared to the crown, this was dead simple and we just mitered the corners so they'd look nice from below and tacked the pieces in place with more finished nails with the top edge of the one x four flush with the top of the one x two nailers we had added previously. The last bit of longer trim to install was more of the smaller crown on the underside of the soffit, which again just serves to hide those edges and helps to avoid more drywall work. And this installed in the same way, but I just wanted to show where we installed it in case you're trying to follow along at home. Finally, I could finish out those smaller crown pieces around the bottom of the soffit, which was just more of the same until I got to the return, which is the piece that ends a run of molding like this. I cut one end on the return piece in the same way as the splice, with the crown flat against the fence, but this time I set the bevel angle at 90 degrees so it met up square with the wall. And I thought I had a shot of this, but it's really pretty simple to figure out once you get to this point. To attach the return to the main piece of crown, I used a little wood glue for some strength and CA glue to hold the pieces together while the wood glue dried, and I came back later and added a few brad nails just for good measure. Finally, I could install the piece with more caulk and finish nails, and I also added some glue to that outside corner just to help things stay together over time. So with that, the trim work was done, so I can move on to getting the room prepped for paint, and I started by cleaning up that area where I removed the chair rail. I used a scraper to remove the excess caulk, which definitely would show through the paint, and then I used a 5-in-1 tool to remove any loose drywall paper. And a lot of people would apply mud right over this area, but the drywall paper will absorb the water in the mud and cause some surface finish issues. So instead, it's best to seal the area with some kind of non-water-based primer, either shellac-based or oil-based, and I rolled on my primer over the entire area just to be safe. Once the primer was dry, I came back and prepped for the skim coat of mud which would cover this area by creating some dents wherever there were nail holes, which was basically everywhere. And these dents ensure the mud can fill in below the surface of the wall, and this gives the mud something to hold onto. I used 45 minute mud for this skim coat as I wanted to be able to sand it relatively quickly, and I applied a fairly thick coat along the entire chair rail section, covering any of those imperfections. I also went ahead and patched any nail holes or other surface imperfections in the wall while I was at it. While the mud dried, I could get the remaining holes cut in the ceiling, the first of which was for the in-ceiling Atmos speakers. Again, since I was going through drywall and plywood, I used my jigsaw here, but I wised up and used the shop vac this time to help collect the dust. Next, I could get the hole for the junction box that would house the projector outlet cut. The last holes to cut were for the in-wall speakers, of which there were four. And these came with cutout templates, which I aligned using the line laser, and then I cut out the openings using my drywall saw. And I had to remove a decent amount of insulation to get the speakers to fit, and was having a hell of a time with this one speaker. Oh, wow. You have a freaking nail right there. Only to finally realize there was actually a nail sticking through from, I guess, fastening the siding on the outside of the house, and that was keeping the speaker from fully seating. After figuring that out, I got the speaker mounted permanently and then finished mounting the rest of the speakers as well. So with those mounted, I could move on to final prep by running caulk along all of the trim, which there was quite a bit of in my case. Thankfully, I've gotten a lot better at caulking and this actually went pretty smoothly. My wife also gave me a hand again filling all of those nail holes in the trim with spackling, 
And then I could move on to the part of this project I was dreading most, sanding the drywall. First, I tinted off the room using some plastic sheeting to help contain the dust in this room. And I cut a tiny hole in the sheeting just to stick my lens through and then set up a fan blowing outwards just to help direct any of the airborne dust outside. For sanding, I used a combination of a nine inch sanding pad on an extension, as well as a hand sanding block, and I really just tried to feather everything in as well as I could. After sanding, I got the room cleaned up and then I had to go out of town for a few days. And just due to the really tight deadline on this project, I scheduled for painters to come while I was gone. And thankfully they did a great job and I could get right back to work once I got home. So the first thing I did after paint was get the projector screen installed. And this screen is the Evan S Tab Tension Cinegre 5D model from Elite Screens. And it comes with everything you need to mount it to your ceiling. I laid out locations for the included brackets and then cut the included threaded rod to length as specified in the manual. I then attached the threaded rod to the brackets, attached the brackets to the blocking I'd added previously, and then got everything prepped for raising the screen into place. Thankfully, the screen went in place very smoothly with only a little bit of tweaking, and we just tightened the nuts on the threaded rod to secure the screen in place. Finally, I could test this thing out and it worked awesome, super smooth, fast, and pretty darn quiet. And this Cinegre 5D screen material is ambient light rejecting, which means we can watch our LG Cinebeam 4K projector on it in a fairly bright room. And I'll link to the exact projector screen in the video description below in case you're interested. The final step in the screen install was to add these end caps, which just cover up the extra opening width at each end of the screen. With the projector screen up, I couldn't help but go ahead and get the projector itself installed. Next, I could get the LED strip lights installed, and I just went with some basic inexpensive strip lights off of Amazon and controlled them with a Lutron Casita wireless lamp dimmer. And I was considering Philips Hue since I already have a Philips Hue system, but they would have cost me $360 compared to the 85 bucks I spent on this setup. That said, it would be really easy to retrofit another system with the outlet that I had installed if I want to later on. So speaking of the lights, let's hop back to those light switches and explain how they work in this system. So I wired up this Lutron Casita switch off camera, which just connects as the first point in the recessed lighting circuit. And the switch on the left controls those recessed lights, and the other switch on the right is actually just a remote, which controls that lamp dimmer. So the beauty of this setup is that it also connects to my smart home system, which is Apple HomeKit in my case, and also works with the Logitech Harmony remote I use for this setup. Moving right along, I could get the rest of the speaker system buttoned up, first adding the grills for the rear surround speakers, and then installing the in ceiling speakers, which are angled and can be turned to direct the sound where you want it. Next, I spent some time cleaning up the cables at the front of the room and also expanded the wall opening to accept this awesome wall plate, which is also from Parts Express. And this plate allowed me to really tidy up all those cables, except for the Atmos speaker cables, which the plate doesn't have spots for, and the HDMI cable, but those can just run through the pass-through slot. So the walls in this room were looking a little bare and I figured why not have the artwork pull double duty and help with the sound. So there's this company called Home Theater Seattle that makes these awesome looking movie poster acoustic panels. And unfortunately I couldn't place the panels exactly where I'd want them for ideal acoustics, which is particularly problematic on that back wall. But these panels definitely tamed some of the echo in the room and they also just look amazing. And of course you're probably tired of hearing it, but I'll link to them in the video description below in case you're interested. Next up was one of the pieces I had been most looking forward to as part of this build, our new Lovesack Sectional. Yes, Sectional. So in case you aren't familiar with them, Lovesack is a direct consumer furniture brand and they have two main products, the company's namesake, the Lovesack, which is a giant beanbag chair that is super comfortable but just wouldn't fit in this space, and then the Sectional, which is a totally modular sofa system. So the entire system is completely customizable and reconfigurable which is great because this is a pretty huge sofa and if we ever move, we can rearrange it in a new space. And I just came up with this layout using the layout tool on their website and it just so happened to fit this space perfectly with about two inches to spare on either side. One of the really cool options on a sectional is this built-in charging hub, which features a pair of standard USB ports, a USB-C port, and a 120 volt outlet, all very nicely tucked away between the arm and seat cushion. And I'll link to the Lovesack website along with all the accessories I added in the video description below in case you're interested. 
Also, I should mention, I was fortunate enough to have the founder of Love Sack, Sean, out to the house to check out the new space and film some stuff for his vlog while he was kind of in this area. And we actually filmed an interview talking about the process of starting his business and some advice for aspiring furniture builders or product people out there. And the full interview will be on my second channel and it'll go live at the same time as this video. So go check that out if you're interested. Next on the list were some new blinds, which I had intended to be smart blinds. Unfortunately, Ikea sold out of their new fear tier, I think is how you pronounce it, their new smart blinds really quickly and are sold out indefinitely at the moment. And the only other real options for smart blinds that I've found are just astronomically expensive at around $1,000 per window. So instead, I just temporarily installed these IKEA blackout roller blinds, which look nice, and I'll just swap them out with the new smart blinds as soon as I can get my hands on them. Finally, with everything installed in the space, I could start getting the rest of the furniture moved back in, starting with the media console. And as you can see, because of that wall plate, I was able to create some shorter cables to connect my receiver to the wall and really help cut down on the cable clutter behind the console. And it was at this very moment that I realized my fiber optic HDMI cable that I had run through all the walls was oriented backwards. No! But I just wanted to get this darn room set up, so I ran a temporary HDMI cable across to the projector just so I could start to use the system and get it all dialed in. After just a little bit of fiddling, I was able to get my one button home theater set up like I'd been envisioning from the beginning. One button, screen comes down, projector turns on, receiver turns on, sets the input, turns on the Apple TV, and the room is transformed from normal living room to dedicated home theater. So with that, this project was pretty much wrapped up. I just needed to fix that HDMI cable off camera, and then I could call this project complete, at least until I get my smart blinds. All right, hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. This was a huge project as evidenced by the length of this video, but I absolutely love the way it came together. If you guys are interested in tackling a project like this yourself, I'll have links to all of the tools and materials I use down in the video description below. Also, if it's your first time here, why not go ahead and get subscribed and ring that little notification bell so you don't miss any of my future videos. And last, why not check out this video that YouTube thinks you will like. All right, thanks again for watching everybody. And until next time, happy building.